Well, let's open our Bibles to Matthew 24. And what we're doing, if you saw the front of the bulletin, basically, I thought I would lump together, um, uh, you know, we get uh, questions that are just, there's so many little different ones, and I try and put them into groupings. And so tonight's are all under the grouping of eschatology. Uh, there are nine branches of theology, and this is one of them. And uh, what makes it significant is that more than a fourth of the Bible is eschatological about the future. So if you have, um, you know, difficulties in understanding eschatology, that just ruins a lot of the Bible uh, because you don't know what it's talking about and what it means. And so just some of these, uh, do Daniel, what do Daniel and Ezekiel say about Israel's rebirth? And uh, they say a lot. Uh, Russia's invasion. Uh, the word Russia is not in the Bible, but it's certainly, uh, you know, if I said between Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, south of Lake Superior, and due west of Lake Erie, what would I be talking about? Yeah. So, so Michigan doesn't have to be in the sentence, right, for you to get it. And that's, that's uh, Russia's invasion. Uh, in um, uh, Ezekiel 35, it, it repeatedly talks about the everlasting hatred that the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Edom or Esau have toward Israel. Uh, a lot of people think that Islam started the hatred. No, it's just given it a much larger platform. Long before Muhammad was enlisted by the angel of light to become the, the great potent force against the truth that it is, long before that, the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Esau intermarried and Ezekiel the prophet said they have an unending, perpetual, literally everlasting hatred for the nation of Israel. And so uh, where did Islam's everlasting enmity come from? They just got it from their ancestors and it's been ramped up. Um, and how does that affect the end of days? So let's, to do a, a course on eschatology, I thought we would start with the greatest teacher on eschatology, and it's not Hal Lindsey or, uh, you know, John MacArthur or, or even John Wolver. The person that, that most uh, effectively communicates it is our Lord Jesus Christ. And look at Matthew 24, uh, because actually as we're looking at this, there are, there are two views of, of eschatology. Um, and, and you'll come into this, especially if you have mainline denominational relatives uh, or even come from that. There are people that interpret Paul, they interpret Paul by Christ. In other words, they say what Paul meant and they, they kind of read into Paul what Christ said. And there are other people that interpret Christ by Paul. And they, they kind of read over, uh, they try and, and say, well, what Jesus meant here is this and that. And what they think is that Paul and Christ weren't saying the same thing. And the problem with that view is that the Spirit of Christ was speaking through Paul. Jesus Christ spoke in the Sermon on the Mount of Olives, the sermon called the Olivet Discourse, and it's Jesus Christ that was speaking through all the Old Testament prophets, and it's Jesus who puts it all together in Revelation. So there is no um, problem between Paul and Christ. And, and you, you say, what are you talking about with Paul? Well, people, the mainliners, believe that Paul invented the rapture. And, and that, you know, and it was just kind of like uh, the role of women. It was just something that was his opinion rather than seeing inspiration. So let's, let's start with Jesus giving a prophetic seminar, and I'm just going to pull out, we could go through the whole chapter. This is Jesus' longest sermon uh, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, uh, on last things in eschatology. But look at verse 15, and uh, what I love about this is, Jesus is, is teaching along, and in verse 15 it says, Therefore, now it started back in verses 1 and 2 when they asked him about the end. And so Jesus is answering. And in verse 15 of Matthew 24, he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation 
spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and on and on he goes. Now let's just examine uh, for just a moment what, what is going on here, because uh, look, at, look at, first of all, uh, who is talking? Uh, Jesus is talking. So you have to really, I mean, he is answering a question about the future. And so Jesus says, when you see, and, and he lists off this, this term, abomination that causes desolation. And then he cites it as, as being from Daniel. So immediately something has happened. Jesus is authenticating the book of Daniel. Now, if you want to have a, a book that, that most mainline, liberal, Protestant, uh, you know, denying inspiration people, a book they hate being written by Daniel is the book of Daniel. Because Daniel, if you know the, the chronology, Daniel was, was taken away from Jerusalem in 586, and he lives through the entire 70-year captivity. And at the end of, of that captivity in 516 B.C., we're talking, he is praying in Daniel chapter 9 where this, is, this um, prophecy is coming from, Daniel's book of, of all of his visions and, and everything, and he is praying through the Lord to take Israel back because the 70 years of their desolation are over. He lived through them in Babylon. And so the, what the liberals don't like is that gives us a hard 6th century B.C. I mean, if you just want to think about this, Daniel right there is writing in the 6th century B.C. That's what that means. And if Daniel is writing in the 6th century B.C., he describes to the T a fellow by the name of Alexander the Great. One of the few, you know, people, you know they're great if you know them by their first name, you know. That's why all the new entertainers go by one name, you know. They want to be great. Uh, but in past, if you were a David, an Alexander, you know what I mean, an Abraham, you stood out. You were one of the greats of all history. Alexander the Great, when he was coming to destroy Jerusalem, and by the way, Alexander the Great lived in the 4th century. So Daniel wrote about him 200 years before his time before his birth. Alexander's living in the fourth century, and when he comes to the gates of Jerusalem, and he had just destroyed and pulverized everywhere else he went, they came out with a copy of Daniel's scroll and read to him what Daniel said. And when Alexander saw himself in Daniel's writings, he didn't destroy Jerusalem. That's how clear Daniel's prophecy is. He saw it was him. He saw himself in, even though he wasn't a believer, he knew that God was talking about him. So liberals don't like that because you know what that would say? That would say that there's biblical prophecy, that in the 6th century God was writing history that was going to happen 200 years in the future. And that's not unusual for God. That's his signature. That's how he said, you know I'm God. But it is not acceptable today because we're trying by were. Our world is trying to marginalize the Bible, say it doesn't speak to us and it's kind of old-fashioned. It was good for an era. But the more you study prophecy, the more amazing it is that just as God wrote explicit detail, I'll show you in just a minute, 200 years before, and it comes to pass exactly as he says. Even so, 2,600 years ago, this is the 6th century B.C., the Lord wrote in explicit detail what's happening today, too. See, that's what people don't like. They don't, they don't mind the Bible being tied to something in the past, but you tie it to something that looks like it's happening now, they don't like it because they don't want to think that God is holding the steering wheel of history. So, spoken of by Daniel, Jesus verifies the historicity, the authenticity, the reliability of the prophet Daniel. But look at, look at what Daniel said was going to happen, and we're going to examine this. Daniel said in the 6th century B.C. that at a future time, this thing was going to take place. Now, I'm not going to get into this abomination that causes desolation, 
Uh, but in the context of where Daniel is, is talking, he's talking about one of the most described people in the Bible. He is called by more than 20 different terms. And he, we know him as the Antichrist. And on Sunday morning, Lord willing, the first seal that we're getting to in Revelation 6 is going to introduce him. And he is going to be the one that brings humanity what we've always looked for. He's going to bring world peace. Did you know there's going to be world peace? There's going to be an absence of war on this planet. And there's going to be a man, a politician, a man who can talk like nobody's talked before since Christ. And he's going to get everybody behind him. And that's the first seal. We're going to come to that. But in the midst of what he does, he is going to set up an abomination that causes desolation in the holy place. So what that means is that Jesus told his disciples that Daniel was right when Daniel said that at the end of the world, there was going to be a temple in Jerusalem that the Jews worship. That's what the holy place is. And that there was going to be an idol put into that place. So you know what that means? It means there has to be a nation Israel. That means that God's going to have to preserve the Jewish people for 2,600 years from 600 B.C. to we're now 2,613 years later. And they're going to have to continuously exist and not get exterminated. But they're going to have to be identifiably back in Jerusalem. And that happened in the last half of the last century. And so we're, we're starting to chart we are alive in what the Old Testament calls the, the last or final generation. It's very interesting uh, that, that we are seeing a time in history that is uh, astounding. Okay, so that's Jesus introducing biblical prophecy, and he's an expert on it. Uh, the Bible's full of, full of it. There are 8,362 predictive verses. And any of you that are real, you know, you love books and stuff, this is a great book. This is a man, J. Barton Payne, uh, who was a professor, by the way, at my alma mater many years before I got there. He, he is more from the 40s, and I'm from the 50s. Uh, but uh, he spent his life analyzing the Bible, and actually his book, the Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy, is this thick, and, and he actually prints out all 8,362 predictive verses. He, he sorts them under the subheadings of what they're predicting, and what he finds is that there are 1,817 separate prophetic predictions in the Bible, and they involve, if you sort them out, kind of like you, you put things where they belong, there are 737 separate distinct, uh, biblically definable events that, that God has predicted are going to happen. Uh, and so basically what we can say is one of these is the return of Christ to rule on the earth. Jesus is coming back to rule. I think most of Christendom would believe that in some form or another. 1,845 times in the Old Testament, 17. That's almost half of all the Old Testament books allude to that. In the New Testament, there are 318. Uh, of the 250 New Testament chapters, 216 of them talk about Christ's second coming. That's a big topic. 23 of the 27 New Testament books, it comes down to 28%. Uh, almost a third of the Old Testament is speaking about future events. A fifth, or more than a fifth, 21% of the New Testament. All told, if you, you know, blend all that together, more than a fourth, 27%. Of the Bible is under that that systematic theology term of eschatology. Now, basically, what are the divisions of, of uh, theology? And, and theology is very important. Um, in fact, uh, I just met someone coming in tonight, and they introduced themselves, and they told me what church they were going to. And I thought, anytime you'd get a person their age out on a snowy night, Sunday night, coming to a church like this, I know where they came from. They came from a church that emphasizes theology. And so their pastor told them, look for a church where the Bible is taught. 
which is amazing, astounding for a college student. Uh, the first realm of theology is, is bibliology. That's a study of the inspiration, authority, and inerrancy of the word. Then you get into what we call theology proper, the attributes of God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the triunity and all the... Uh, there's much about that. In fact, in our life groups, uh, some of the elders are teaching through the communicable and non-communicable attributes of God, uh, or they were before we had our combined Sunday school for five weeks. Christology proper, you know, the Lord, pneumatology, the word pneuma, like in pneumonia, that means spirit, so it's a study of the spirit. Angelology, anthropology. I mean, the Bible gives a complete anthropology, where all of the language groups came from, where all of the various uh, divisions ethnically of humanity, they all stem from one blood. I mean, if you believe the Bible's anthropology, racism has no place because there's only one race. How can you have racism if there's only one race? Any criticism of race, you're criticizing yourself because Acts 17 says, God made from one blood all the peoples of the earth. There aren't three races, there are one, if you're biblical. Uh, soteriology, uh, the, the theology of salvation. Ecclesiology, how God designed and, and, and has his plans for the church. And now, what we're looking at tonight. The ninth branch is heskatos. This word uh, means last or final. So a study of the final or last things. And that's the end times. And so we're, I'm trying to cover tonight uh, what I taught for a whole semester at the Master's Seminary. We're going to do it all tonight. Since it's snowing anyway, might as well stay. We have communion crackers in the kitchen. Uh, if we run out of food, we can go. Uh, I'm not going to cover this tonight, but the, the essence of eschatology is understanding that God has made a distinction between Israel, his chosen people of promise, that he made an unbreakable promise with as he sovereignly elected the nation of Israel to be not because they're better, maybe because they're worse than all the other nations, but he picked them. And he said, I set my love on you and I will never, never take my love away. He also set his love on the church. There is a different origin. The church and Israel have completely different origins. They have a different mission that the Lord has established them. They have different destinies. Uh, if you remember, the 12 gates of the 12 tribes and 12 foundation stones or the 12 apostles of the church, both are melded together in heaven, but they have different destinies while they're serving the Lord here on earth. The replacement view, which, by the way, replacement theology is the theology of Methodism, Lutheranism, Anglicanism, Roman Catholicism, uh, some some variants of Baptist uh, theology and a lot of other uh, groups believe that Israel has been replaced. They were kicked off the team and a new player came in. What the problem with that is it makes God a liar because God says that I have made an everlasting covenant with Abraham and what's interesting is God defines it. He says, I give him a land, and I give him a promised blessing and, that, and, and, and a future that, that they are going to have this, this geography. You know what's so amazing is um, the United Nations offered Israel equivalent land from where they are on the hinge of Africa and Asia and Europe from the Middle East. They offered them the equivalent amount of land in Africa. They said, you can have it. it, you can move, and you don't have to have any more fighting. You just move and farm. But see, God says, you can't, you can't do that because I promised them where they are. And, and that's going to become the deciding factor. In fact, uh, Zechariah tells us, 12 through 14, that it's going to become Israel wanting Jerusalem is going to become a heavy burdensome stone. It's kind of like, you know, someone says, here, you know, this, this, this is falling. Would you hold it up for me for a minute? Well, for a moment, it's okay to hold it up for them, but what you want them to do is get out of the way and let it fall. Jerusalem, the whole world, is feeling the weight of it falling, and they don't want it to fall because it's going to cause world war, and so they're holding it up, but it's getting burdensome, and it's starting to squash people. In fact, did you read today's news? Iran said, an attack on Syria is an attack on Iran. Russia said an attack on Syria is an attack on Russia. An attack on Iran is an attack on Russia. I mean, you read the newspaper, you say, so what? 
Well, it says in Ezekiel that Iran and Syria and Russia are going to attack Israel. That's interesting. Uh, it forms the basis for Christian anti-Semitism. By the way, Martin Luther, our friend, the reformer, a godly, gospel-preaching man, didn't have good eschatology. So you should be careful of your eschatology. And he wrote a track, a little pamphlet. It's called To the German Nobility. And you know what it says in there? Kill the Jews. They deserve it. They're Christ killers. Kill them. You know who read that? Yeah. He was a good German churchgoer. And he said, let's do it. So be careful. Uh, replacement theology breeds bad company. The 70 weeks that we're going to see tonight deal specifically with Israel. Paul has a dichotomy. When Paul talks to the church, he talks about the Jews and the Gentiles are to have no dividing wall between them. He doesn't say there aren't any Jews, and he doesn't say the Jews' promises have gone to the church. What he said is those ethnic descendants of Abraham, as God is dealing in this time period with the church, they are to have no divisions between them. He didn't say they're evaporating and disappearing and should be killed or anything else. He sees that God sees these two groups distinctly different in their origin, mission, and destiny. In Christ, we're one. There's no wall between us. And so that means this whole idea of if we really want to do church right, do it like the messianic, you know, congregations and we've got to change everything. No, Paul never advocated all that stuff. That's a modern thing and it's not healthy. Uh, by the way, if you read the book of Revelation, it's very interesting from Revelation 4 on, there are distinctives between Israel and the church, very clear ones. And so uh, that would just be a thumbnail sketch of another branch of theology we could call Israelology, what God teaches about Israel. All that has led to uh, eschatology has many, I mean, you hear all these words. Ah, millennialism is preterism in the historist position. Uh, preterism means it already happened. Historist means it's just a kind of like an overview of history. And then there's the idealism, which is so vague, we don't know what it is. But that's the amillennial view. But look what amillennialism depends upon allegorical interpretation. Why? Because it's so clear what God said that you have to say, well, that's not what he meant. You have to, you have, to have a key, kind of like uh, in, in an allegory like Pilgrim's Progress, which is an allegory, and it's a good one. An allegory isn't bad unless God meant it to be literal. But in Pilgrim's Progress, you know, Doubting Castle and Giant Despair, those those weren't people, those represented things. That's what an allegory is. So what they say is that God wasn't clear about what he meant about Israel. What he was saying was, Israel have all the land from the Euphrates River to the Great Sea. What that means is the church should go into all the world and preach the gospel. That you, out, you, you redefine everything God says and, and give it a different meaning. So the allegorical Hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is how you interpret the scripture. Homiletics is how you communicate it. Hermeneutics is how you understand the proper uh, understanding of it. Literal happens to be allegorical is not how anybody in the Bible interprets prophetic things. Nobody. We see many people in the Bible seeing fulfilled prophecies. All of them took them literally. Where would Jesus be born? In Bethlehem. Well, what does that mean? House of bread. Let's see. That might mean a bakery. You know what I mean? You just, it couldn't mean literally a city called that. No, when, when, when the Bible, when Daniel was praying in Daniel 9 about Jeremiah's prophecy, Jeremiah said that Israel would be in captivity for 70 years. How did Daniel interpret the number 70? Oh, it could mean, you know, 70 ages or 70 rulers. No, he, it said 70 years. He said it's 70 years. Literal is the way everybody in the Bible that we see interacting with prophecy, everybody took it that way. Allegorical is when there's a clear allegory like Hagar uh, representing the law and the son of promise 
Isaac. And so Paul said, which is an allegory. It was so unusual for him to even use that. He described it and uses that term in Galatians, but not when he's talking about the future. So your hermeneutics is very dependent uh, your, your, your basic hermeneutic, whether you take the literal, historic, grammatical way of looking at the Bible, will determine everything. So eschatology has three main branches. The amillennials, uh, uh, this would be all the people, you know, like uh, St. Augustine is here. Uh, the, the Christian reform churches are here. The uh, Methodists are a lot of them, and the Presbyterians are here. Postmillennialists, these are the Reconstructionists. You ever heard of uh, Rush Dooney, uh, the great cultural, I don't even know how you spell Rush Dooney, uh, Bonson, uh, these are prolific authors. Uh, this is, these are the people that say, get guns and get a fort and live out in the country, and, and uh, we're going to, they're called theonomists, and they believe that Christ is going to come return. This ah means no millennium. Post means Jesus is coming after the millennium. So they believe there's a millennium. They don't know what it means, but there's going to be one. But Jesus doesn't come till after. And so you have to control the earth. Uh, and so theonomy is really popular these days. And it's the idea that we've got to take over culture. And we've got, to, we've got to get all the laws. I mean, we have to start doing what they did in Exodus. And if they are homosexuals, then you know what Exodus says to do to them, do that. And if they're a witch, you know what Exodus says, do that to them. You know what Leviticus says to do these? And they want to have theo, the word for God, nomo law. They want to have God's law to be instituted on culture and society. We have to be very careful about that. Does God ever say we're supposed to institute his we're supposed to govern unsaved people with the laws he wrote down for his covenant people? That's an interesting thought. And a lot of believers don't think about that. We get all wrapped up in, you know, Christian nation and go for our political guy. Theonomy, reconstructionism, the idea of conquering culture for Christ is not biblical. That's not in the Bible. Conquer individuals with the love of Christ and see them gloriously converted and start having the law of Christ written on their hearts is all through the Bible. But to make America under the Levitical laws, that's not in the Bible. And so we waste a lot of energy. And this Reconstruction movement is interesting and, and it's kind of a bunker mentality. We're going to outlast them. We're going to slowly, you know, if we have a lot of children and if we, you know, get... Texas, and then we'll get Oklahoma, and then in 50 or 1,000 years, we'll get the South all right, and then finally we'll get New England. In California, by then, it'll be earthquaked off, you know. And uh, <laughs> that isn't biblical. Uh, maybe leading people to Christ in church planning, but not politically trying to cantilever until we conquer our country, because we've already read that evil men and seducers will get worse and worse, and that in the last times, people will be lovers of their own selves. We already know that we can't institute all that. So see, your eschatology is very important. A lot of people are investing a lot of time here that God does not command us or even infer for us. Then there's pre, that means before millennialism, which means that Christ comes down before the millennium. Well, what's interesting is this. Now watch how complicated it gets. Now this is going to look like the gerrymandering that the uh, politicians are working on, you know, moving the congressional districts around. Look at all that stuff. What is that stuff? Well, within the, the Christ returning before the millennium, we have three different camps. It's almost like denominations, you know. Uh, uh, oh, I have to be real careful with my humor. Oh, boy. Well, I'll just tell one thing. When I grew up in Michigan, I was uh, ordained uh, way back in the... Well, I was ordained in the 80s, but I was in this movement in the 70s. It was called IFBAM. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean to, to um, anybody here. You might even know what that is, but it was, and I'm not critical, I'm just telling you something. Independent Fundamental Baptist Association of Michigan. It's a wonderful group. I'm ordained by them. But did you know 
what the men at the fellowship meetings, what that acronym meant to them. I fight Baptist all over Michigan. Because there were many Bible teaching, Bible believing that weren't in their fellowship, but they wouldn't have anything to do with them. And see, that's kind of what even these views do among true believers. Okay, post-tribulationalists believe that Jesus Christ comes at the end of the tribulation, after the tribulation. And so what they do is they equate the second coming and the rapture as simultaneous. That's many denominations, that's almost all covenant theologians, unless they're odd ducks, uh, would believe that. Then there's the mid-tribulational view, which, which actually was originated way back a long time ago, but um, uh, uh, Everett Harrison is the one that, uh, he called it Christian uh, triumphalism, uh, and, and he, he believed that only the overcomers would get raptured and all the other believers had to bake for a while in the tribulation. And when they baked for a while, then the Lord would get them after they came to their senses. But it's been more popularized these days by um, the guy that owns Xerox, I forgot, Van Campen. Uh, Bob Van Campen, his family, he was a godly Bible scholar. Uh, Van Camp and Merritt, you know, they were very, very wealthy. He bought Xerox for $600 million. I remember that. He was loaded. But he spent all of his time, he lived, by the way, his home was here in Michigan, one of them, uh, on the lake um, outside of Chicago, up, you know, um, South Haven way. But Bob Van Campen spent two years plus of his life writing um, about this view. And, uh, and then he gave the book to Marv uh, Rosenthal, and uh, the, the mid-tribulational view got a lot of traction there. I still remember when Bob Van Campen brought his manuscript to John MacArthur, to all of us and the faculty at the Master's Seminary, and uh, Bob Van Campen was a real businessman. He said to John MacArthur, he said, I'd like you to read my book. John said, I love reading your book. You're a good friend of mine. He says, well, I give you $15 million a year. If you don't agree with my book, I'm going to stop. That's amazing. He gave $5 million to the seminary, $5 million to the college, and $5 million to the radio. And uh, John said, I don't agree with your book. And he stopped giving his $5 million. And he gave it to Marv Rosenthal. So uh, that's how we got the big thing in Florida, that big um, Holy Land experience thing. Then there's the pre-tribulational view, uh, which would be Dallas Seminary, uh, you know, Swindoll, MacArthur, you know, Walvoord, that whole thing. That's dispensational theologians. Uh, who believe in the literal. And, and I would say that these mid-tribulationists believe in the literal too. Uh, but these post-tribulationists, they have to not be as literal because it doesn't fit. So this is eschatology, and, and I've already gone way further. In fact, at the funeral yesterday, um, I was talking to someone at, after the funeral at the meal, and uh, I told them that, that I had done a, a while back a funeral uh, of someone I'd known when I pastored in California and John MacArthur did part of the funeral and I did part of the funeral and I said when John got done there was not much to say so I was brief and the person was sitting down they looked up they said have you ever been brief <laughs> that was a low blow okay real quickly for you to understand uh, and and we're gonna really zip through this we're talking about Daniel Daniel the prophet is is alive right here and is taken away in the first siege of Jerusalem. Do you remember, from God's perspective, all history revolves around Jerusalem, God's people, God's people of promise, the ones through whom he, he brought the message of salvation and, and the scriptures came, and through whom he's going to work for the end of the world. I mean, God just is Jerusalem-centric. And that's how he thinks. And so that's how history is to God. It's all revolving not around, you know, anyone else but the Jewish people. Now, Jerusalem is conquered by Babylon three times. This is where we ended last time. The first group, Daniel. The second group that were taken off as exiles is Ezekiel. The final group were just the, the uh, average people in the temple and the city were destroyed. Lots of stuff here that you don't, need to worry about. There's two separate countdowns with God, uh, how long they were going to serve, 70 years, and then they were going to start coming back. But Jerusalem, until Nehemiah put up the walls, was desolate. So there's two separate clocks God has, and that's just uh, 
what you would do in, you know, in a uh, community Bible study or BCF when, or uh, BSF when you're studying deep. But Ezekiel and Daniel both are describing this time. Uh, and and Zechariah uh, follows them and describes it too. The big thing that Daniel tells us about that, that you need to understand to understand biblical prophecy is where we start in Matthew 24. And that is what, what we call the 70 weeks of Daniel. So let me just plow through this. Um, in Daniel 2, he sees this, uh, well, first Nebuchadnezzar sees it, then Daniel is introduced to it by God. Uh, this statue with a head of gold, uh, the, the midsection here of silver, uh, waist down uh, of brass, and then iron that decays and gets weak in the toes uh, with uh, iron and clay. And basically, in Daniel 7, sees the same thing, only it's a winged lion, a bear on its side, a leopard, a terrible beast, and a ten-headed creature. And basically, Daniel starts out saying that the head of gold, God tells him, is Babylon. Then he says the Medes and the Persians are going to come. The Medes are in the news every day. You ever hear about Kurdistan and the Kurds? In English, the word Mede in Hebrew is Kurd today. So when you read about the Kurds, you know, and they're... They're in northern Iraq, and they're in Turkey, and they're all over the place. They're the Medo-Persians. See, these people are still around, all of them, uh, from Bible times. It's unbelievable. Then Alexander, remember I told you he came zipping through town, and they took the scroll out and showed him that he was the leopard, that he was this, this brass part of the, of the statue, but he's the leopard, and uh, and that's conquering quickly and also in chapter 8 he's called a ram and he goes out and and uh, or a goat I mean goes out and his horn breaks off and we'll get to that but basically right here is what's so interesting and I think it will help all of us understand God says that all of human history until he ends human history that everything is built around four empires the Babylonian Empire was the first, the greatest, the wealthiest. The Medo-Persian Empire was stronger, but not as rich. In fact, uh, Persopolis and all the places of Persia were known for their silver. They had gold, but they were known for their silver. Uh, Alexander wasn't even in it for the loot. He just was rapidly conquering. And then Rome came, and it speaks of iron. And Rome lasted a long time. If you know anything about uh, Rome's history from 753 B.C. until 1456, 1476, 14, I don't know. Boy, I'm getting old. But for 21, 2200 years, the Roman Empire. While Christopher Columbus was alive, there was a Roman Empire on earth with legionnaires and everything and an emperor. Uh, in Constantinople. So this enduring empire that lasted more than 2,000 years never really went away. It just kind of broke up. And, and it was in two parts, the two legs. Uh, there was an eastern and a western empire, and, uh, and it's coming back. See, the Lord says the end of the world is going to be Rome revived. And it's very interesting, the implications of that. So, uh, then if you remember, Daniel 2 says that a stone came and crushed uh, that statue and this mountain came, and that speaks of Christ's kingdom coming. Then Daniel 8 talks more about Alexander, the notable horn. Uh, see, this is why liberals don't like Daniel. Daniel describes in such intricate details the future that, that if you don't believe in inspiration, it's astounding that in the 6th century, he knew what was going to happen in the 4th and 3rd centuries. The kings, what battles they were going to win, and everything else. Uh, but the ram is defeated by the goat from the west. The ram is the Medo-Persian. The goat from the west is Alexander coming quickly. His feet don't even touch the ground in Daniel's vision. The notable horn is Alexander, but when it hits the ram, it breaks off and four horns come out. And then it talks about from the four, a little horn comes. And then Daniel interprets that. He, he sees this and he gets sick seeing it. And if you've read Daniel, and he, when he realizes what's coming, it gets him. Basically, the four horns we know from history 
Cassander, one of generals of Alexander's general, he took the homeland, Macedonia, where uh, Alexander's father Philip was from, and Greece proper, where Alexander was from. Uh, Lysimachus took Thrace and Bithynia, most of Asia Minor, Turkey, you can think of that. Ptolemy took Egypt. You probably heard of Cleopatra, the Ptolemaic descendant, and Cyrene, uh, which is Libya. And then Seleucus took Syria, and that's and from Syria all the way to India. So what's interesting, out of uh, the Seleucian, Seleucian uh, division comes this Antiochus, and he's the guy that sacrificed the pig on the altar in Jerusalem. But he begins to be this little horn that prefigures the Antichrist. Uh, but Daniel 9, and this is where uh, we need to, to get to and where we'll pick up next time. Daniel 9 is the most amazing prophetic chapter of all. And the reason I say that is, real quickly before we go, Daniel 9 is a prayer. Daniel is studying the Bible and he is praying through the scripture, praying for his people, praying, and all of a sudden his prayer is interrupted by Gabriel. And if Gabriel's important. Gabriel's the one that announces that Jesus is coming. And Gabriel's the one that, that is, is there and, and speaking um, into the, the events for the children of Israel. But Gabriel visits and gives to Daniel, in Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27, a very interesting prophecy. And we just have enough time to read it. So turn to Daniel 9. I want to show you something. You've never seen it before. This is the most amazing prophecy in the Bible basically has four parts. Uh, you know, if you like uh, three-point sermons with a poem, this is almost that good. It talks about the scope of God's plan for history in verse 24. Then it talks about a period of time called 69 weeks. Then it says there's this period where, it, it, like the clock, you know, is off. Uh, the game, you know, when they're running around and measuring and everything, the clock's not running. There's an interval period. And then there's a final segment of time. And this 70th week is where we get the seven-year tribulation from. So let, let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, in your Bibles, verse 24, 70 weeks. Now, it, it doesn't really say weeks. It's actually a, an interesting term that in English would be the word heptads. It's like the word dozens. What does dozens mean? It means groups of what? Twelves, yeah. Heptads means groups of sevens. So this a heptatic structure is revolving around the number seven. So it says 70 heptads are determined upon thy people. So what we're seeing is the scope of history, God says, is all God has, has designed all history is, is surrounding the people he chose way back 21 centuries before Christ. In Ab oh, he chose them eternity past, but, but he revealed it to us in Abraham's time. The Jews, the descendants of Judah, uh, the Yehudim, the Jews. So Daniel's people are the Jews, and God determines 70 heptads. What is 7 times 7? Seven? 7 times 7 is 49. So 7 times 70 would be 490. So God says, I have planned 490 years for the Jewish people. And not just for the Jewish people. Remember the UN wanted to give them Rhodesia or something, you know, some land out in Africa? Doesn't work. God says, I have put my plan for those Jewish people, and it's totally bound up with the holy city, the city of Jerusalem. And then he says... And, and this is a study in itself, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Wow, what on earth is that? There's only one thing. There's only one thing that finished transgressions, made an end of sin, reconciled iniquities, and brought in everlasting righteousness, and that's the cross of Christ. And so something in this 490 years involves Christ dying on the cross and this 490 years also seals up the vision and prophecy and anoints the most holy place. So something big is happening. So that's what verse 24 is about the scope. Part two, remember there are four parts, 
is the 69 weeks. Now look at verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. So uh, Artaxerxes tells them that they can go back and rebuild Jerusalem. So from that command unto Messiah the King. Now if you read the Gospels, you see that Palm Sunday, as we call it, Jesus comes in and, and they're saying, Hosanna, save us, and you're the king. And, and, and they say, tell the people to stop saying that. They told Jesus. Jesus said, if they didn't say it, the rocks would cry out. Because it was a very important day to God. It was the day that Jesus Christ offered himself to the Jewish people as their king. And they rejected him as their king. And so he died as the savior of the world. But what's interesting is seven heptads and three score is 60 and two. So we have, we have seven plus 60 plus two. So we have 69 heptads, hep, groups of seven, which equals 483 years. So something is going to happen in that time period. Basically, what he's saying is the 69 weeks go from when the commandment came from the secular king that they could restore Jerusalem until Jesus offered himself, you know, Zechariah 9.9, Behold, your king comes, meek and lowly, sitting on the colt of a donkey. And, and when Jesus came riding into town on the donkey and they threw their clothes down, their cloaks, and with the palm branches, it was 483 years. Now, if you look on the calendar, actually it's, it's 445 B.C. to 30 A.D., and that's 475 years, but they have not always calculated years as 360 days. We have a Gregorian calendar. We also have the Julian calendar. There have been so many corrections, but if you look at Jewish years, which are 360 day years, not 364 and a half or five and a quarter years. Uh, it's wonderful mathematics. The Royal Astronomy uh, Astronomical Society of Britain worked it out. But look what Jesus said when he came for Palm Sunday. When he was come near in Luke 19, beheld the city, he wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, at least in this thy day. Jesus said when he rode into town, it was their day. And it was what was promised would happen, that Messiah would offer himself as king. And then Jesus said, because you didn't know your day, the day will come upon thee, and the enemy shall cast a trench about thee, compass thee round, keep thee on every side, and mow you down. Basically, after the three score and two weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. That's the substitutionary atonement that Daniel 9, 26. This is the heart of the gospel that the, the promised Savior would be cut off, not for himself. And look at this, and this is where we'll have to pick up next time. This is fascinating. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city of Jerusalem and the temple. Now, we know when that happened. After, notice it says, after this Jesus announcing himself as Messiah, that the people of the prince that shall come, the Romans, are going to come and destroy the city of Jerusalem and the temple. And the end, therefore, shall be with a flood, and unto the end wars and desolations are determined. Then, if you want to see a chart of it, verse 25 says there's going to be this 69-week period that ends at what we call Palm Sunday, or Christ riding into town, offering himself as the Messiah. Then after that 69 weeks ends, after it, Messiah would be cut off, that's the cross, and the city of Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed. And it just goes, mm. you know, it's kind of like TVs used to go, when the programming ended, it just hummed. That's the interval. But verse 27 down here is what is the most remarkable thing. I stopped with you on verse 26. What does verse 27 say? If you look down at your Bible, it says, Look at these words. And he, the prince, shall enforce covenant with the many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause. You see, 
if you counted and did the math, there's one week left out. God has accounted for his time clock stopped after 69 weeks. And that stopping after the clock stopped, Christ was crucified, Jerusalem was destroyed, and it's going to hum for a while. But the prince that shall come, wait a minute, what prince is that? The people of the prince shall come and destroy the city. Who destroyed Jerusalem? The Romans. What empire destroyed Jerusalem and the temple? The Romans. The people of the prince that shall come. So what it's saying is, that's where we get the revived Roman Empire. Uh, in the midst of the week, this prince that shall come, this, this antichrist, that is somehow involved with this revived Roman Empire is going to enforce the covenant for one week. That's seven years. There's where we get the tribulation from, right there. And in the midst of the week, now you've heard of mid-trib, that's where the middle is. The midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And that's where we're going to pick up next time, because we've run out of time. We didn't get the whole semester done today. So, uh, let's all stand, and what I'm going to do is... Um, Read off these names.